Dylan's running late, so I'm gonna kick us off here. Let's start by singing number 32. 32. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that Christ is our righteousness, and uh, thank you for the work that he has done for us and is doing in us, and we pray that as we um, gather now to open your word and uh, hear what you have to teach us, that our hearts would be softened uh, towards you, that uh, we would worship you in spirit and in truth, and that we would grow in our love for our Savior. We thank you for the time ahead of us, 
And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn to our memory work. Again, reviewing, starting with Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. 2 Timothy 2, 2. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. 2 Peter 1, 5 through 9. Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Jude 3. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you, appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all handed down to the saints. Luke 9.23 And he was saying to them all, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Turn over a page to our theme hymn, and we'll stand as we sing.
last thing. Let's see. Okay. I asked David if I would need his help to set this up up here. He said no. Okay, good. I've kind of, I've kind of enjoyed doing this, uh, my computer program that I use every day, Logos. Um, so it's fun to kind of show you the verse that we're talking about. No PowerPoint, but uh, we'll do it this way. Try it this way. Okay. Um, good morning. Good to see you. And uh, let's uh, bow before the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this study of uh, discipleship and uh, especially the aspect that we're going to look at today about your return. And so we pray that you would uh, encourage us uh, with this, remind us of uh, Christ's return, remind us of uh, the moment-by-moment -moment hope that we have, and we pray that you would uh, encourage us, give us a perspective uh, on our task of discipleship um, with this wonderful truth, this blessed hope that we have of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, return uh, for us. And uh, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We're studying discipleship this school year. And uh, this morning, I'm, I'm using one of the um, chapter titles in our book, Living in Hope of Things to Come. That's one of the responsibilities of a disciple. It's kind of a main one, actually. Living in Hope of Things to Come. And so uh, before I get to that, I thought I'd give you just a little bit um, by introduction, a little bit of just kind of generic and review about discipleship, what we've been studying. So um, this is pretty basic to what we've been saying for this school year, that a disciple is also a disciple maker. Um, a disciple is also a disciple maker. And so when we say discipleship, it can kind of be, um, uh, well, what do you mean by that? you know, unclear about what you're saying, but that's what we mean is, is both of those, being a disciple and also being a disciple maker. There's no point at which a disciple is not also a disciple maker, someone following the Lord, helping, some, helping other people to follow after um, the Lord. Um, another way of saying it, there's no point at which God gives life without giving it more abundantly. In other words, overflowing to others um, as well. That's the way he created the natural world. That's the way he creates the uh, new life um, as well. Christ never says, follow me, without also saying, I will make you fishers of men. Okay, those, are, those two go together. So if, if the Lord has told you, follow me, um, the fishers of men part isn't for people with a certain kind of personality, you know, you know, like a sales personality, you know, that's for them. No, it's for, it's for disciples uh, to become also fishers of men. That's part of um, the call. Maybe that's why um, Andrew, remember, I, I think Andrew is one of John the Baptist's disciples and John the Baptist saw Jesus, his cousin, uh, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And uh, Andrew kind of got the message and started following him. And the Lord said, what do you seek? Um, and he said, Rabbi, where, where are you staying? And he said, uh, come and see. So he spent the day with him, Andrew did. And uh, then he went and found Simon, his brother. We have found the Messiah, he says uh, to Simon, and he brought him to Jesus. So I think pretty much the day that Andrew became a disciple, he also, in his own uh, halting, faltering way, also became a disciple maker. Pretty effective one, too, because he brought in um, Peter. So um, that's kind of been, maybe you could say our thesis that a disciple is also a disciple maker, okay? And we've usually started from that end, you know, start with a disciple. We know that. We know we're, we're, we're disciples and then kind of prove to you that a disciple is also a disciple maker. So I thought we'd test our thesis, um, and I'm still just kind of an introduction right now about the whole task of discipleship. But I thought we'd test our thesis from starting from the other end show you a disciple maker and see if we can prove that he's also a disciple. So who's the, who's the greatest disciple maker? Let's start there. Lord Jesus. Okay. Uh, yeah. The Lord Jesus. Okay. So we, I think we all agree with that. 
the Lord Jesus is the greatest disciple maker. That's what he spent his time doing um, on earth. Um, is the Lord Jesus also a disciple? Because we said a disciple is a disciple maker. I'm getting some no's from you guys. You guys are skeptical. So, so I guess our, our thesis doesn't work. Um, let's look at a prophecy. of the Lord. It says, the Lord has given me the tongue of disciples that I may know how to sustain the weary one with the word. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen as a disciple. The Lord has opened my ear and I was not disobedient, nor did I turn back. And uh, this is a prophecy of Christ. That's why the me is capitalized. And then he talks about the way that the Lord opened his ear I gave my back to those who strike me and my cheeks to those who pluck out the beard. I did not cover my face from humiliation and spitting for the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I am not disgraced. Therefore, I've set my face like a flint and I know that I will not be ashamed. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up to each other. Who has a case against me? Let him draw near. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who is he who condemns me? Behold, they will wear out like a garment and the moth uh, will eat uh, them. So this is um, a prophecy about Christ. The first thing it says about him is that the Lord has given him the tongue of disciples. What's the tongue of disciples? Okay. Yeah, I think that's probably a pretty good answer, actually. Um, wh wh why is it called the tongue of disciples? language that they speak. Okay. Okay. It's the Lord's tongue, right? And um, he's, he, uh, God has given him the tongue of disciples, meaning a tongue, a way of speaking that corresponds to exactly what a disciple needs to hear at the right moment. He knows how to speak to a disciple. Okay. That's what it means. He's given me the tongue of disciples and it explains it that I may know how to sustain the weary one with the wor with a word. And if you have a tongue of disciples, that, that's uh, um, what you're going to be able to do. You're going to know how to sustain the weary one with a, a word. Maybe that tells you a little bit about discipleship, what it is. You know, you're going to be able to speak to somebody and, and they're going to be weary and you're going to be able to sustain them with a word. You're going to be able to, that's what it means to, to make um, a disciple. Um, how did he learn to have the tongue of disciples? Well, he starts uh, speaking not about how he speaks, but about how he hears. He, he awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen as a disciple. So the Lord's able to speak in a way that disciples need to hear because he knows what it is to listen as a disciple and to be told what he needs to hear. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not disobedient, nor did I uh, turn uh, back. And so um, the Lord, I, I think you can argue that the Lord was a disciple he was a learner. He, he was one who uh, learned from the Father and walked the path of discipleship. And he's a disciple maker. He's also um, uh, a disciple. So we have verses like this about the Lord um, when he was a boy. Um, the child continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And that's uh, probably from 2 to 10 or 11 or 12, um, that, that, that uh, is said. And then from 12 to uh, on into adulthood, into his 30s, Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. And so he knew what it was to um, grow as a disciple um, in those uh, ways. Hebrews 5, 8 says, although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And so he walked the path of a disciple. He listened to the Lord. The Lord sustained him with a word morning by morning. Um, and so he's able to do that for others. We have a sympathetic high priest who is tempted in all ways um, as we were. And so he's able to sympathize with us in our weaknesses. He's able to know um, and able to speak to us with the tongue of uh, disciples and su sustain the weary one uh, with the word. And I was even thinking of this passage. Um, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we'll be able to comfort those who are in affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. And that's true of Christ. 
he was comforted by God, and so he's able to comfort others with the same um, uh, comfort with which he was um, was uh, comforted as well. So um, this is our um, tells us also a little bit about um, discipleship. Um, if, you're, if you enter into a discipleship relationship with somebody, if you disciple someone, and I don't, I don't mean to make that too formal. I mean, that can be quite informal. Uh, but if you are enter into a discipleship relationship with one person where you're discipling them or you're both discipling each other, you're both helping each other to follow after Christ, how many are there? It's sort of like, how many disciples does it take to change a light bulb? Okay, there's three there. The Lord Jesus Christ is there with the, with the two of you uh, discipling one another. And he's actually the one who knows how to speak uh, a word in a season. We, we uh, take one another to um, each other. Um, a, a couple of passages that um, speak of Christ being there in this task. Um, in the uh, Acts, Acts um, says, um, the first account I composed Theophilus about all that Jesus began to do and teach. That's Luke. Acts is the sequel, same author. Until the day he was taken up to heaven after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. And the implication there is that um, the first part is what Jesus began to do and teach when he was on earth. Now he's up in heaven and he's continuing to do and to teach through his disciples. And disciple is the word that's used more often than any other word for Christians in um, in um, Acts. And the idea is that it's a continuation of what Christ does and teach. He's with us in this task of discipleship. He's the ultimate um, disciple maker. Um, here's another one. Ephesians 2, 17 um, talks about Jews and Gentiles. And then it talks about Christ. He came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near, Gentiles and Jews. But when Christ was on earth, he only preached to Jews. He said that I'm only I called at this moment to the house of Israel. And he talked about another time when they'd be sent out to the Gentiles. But here in Ephesians, it says that Christ came and preached even to the Gentiles, to those who are far. Well, he did it through his disciples. He did it uh, through those uh, and he went with them. And if those are too kind of vague for you um, about Acts being a sequel of what Jesus began to do um, and speak. And then this one about Christ himself um, preaching. Um, just remember the, our, our main uh, passage, um, Matthew, which says he sends them out on this task of discipleship. And then he promises, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I'm with you to help you in the midst of this task of um, of discipleship. And so, so I thought of that as good for our, what we're getting to, we're finally going to get to it, about um, the hope of Christ's return. Discipleship is the task that we do in his absence, his physical absence, but he's present with us in the task of discipleship, and he's present as the master um, disciple maker. So um, this passage about, um, back to this one, uh, Isaiah, um, I think is a good one, um, too, for the task of uh, discipleship and the nature of um, discipleship is the Lord's talking about knowing that God is on your side for a really difficult task. And the task that he's talking about is taking up the cross, giving his cheeks to those who spite, uh, smite him. And he's listened as a disciple. And what he's hearing is God's, God has given you this task and he's on your side with great power. And he's going to vindicate you in this uh, task. And uh, it's similar to what the Lord did with his disciples. He asked them to do difficult things sometimes, like walk on water, like Peter walk on water uh, to him. Or feed the 5,000. Remember what he told them? You feed them. You feed them. You do it. And then they were supposed to understand what um, Christ could do. Or take up your cross. That's a, that's a difficult task. Or do this task of um, discipleship. And um, it's a difficult task. And the ear of a disciple is open to knowing that the Lord is with you um, in it. So that, and that the Lord helps you in it. And that's often what you're going to say to somebody. You're not necessarily going to give them all the answers. Like, here's the instruction manual for life. There's some of that. Definitely in the Bible. Definitely we want to work through that. Um, but a lot of times making disciples has to do with just talking to discouraged people and telling them, like, like he says here, um, 
that I may know how to sustain the weary one with word day by day, morning by morning. Talking to discouraged people when their faith fails and then to say to them, you know, Christ is with you. Christ is with you. Um, God is with you. Um, his love is for you and that should give you courage to walk in the light instead of walking in the darkness. And so um, this is the task. You, you, uh, a disciple needs to meet Christ. That's what uh, Andrew did. He took Simon to Christ himself, and it's the same. And uh, Christ is the one who rescues us from that um, darkness. And it's the same now, except you're going to meet Christ through just an ordinary disciple who uh, speaks to you in the name of Christ, and you're going to meet him um, in that way. Okay, so um, just been thinking about that uh, passage and just how it relates to the task of um, this discipleship. I'm probably only just touching on um, a little bit of it. Um, okay, so living in hope of things to come, living in hope of things to come. The task of discipleship is to be done in light of Christ's return, in light of Christ's return. That uh, actually um, shapes um, what we know of the task and how we do it is that uh, it's to be done in light of Christ any moment impending um, return. So um, the passage um, or the chapter in our book talked about um, seven subject areas about the return of Christ. When will the timing of Christ's return? Number one. Number two, signs of Christ's return. Number three, the removal of the church, the rapture. Number four, the seven-year tribulation period. Number five, God's promises to Israel and his promises to the church. Number six, the millennium, the 1,000-year reign of Christ on earth. And number seven is the exhortations based on Christ's return. And um, we're not going to go through any of those other components. Those are kind of aspects of um, what the Bible teaches about end times. But what I want to emphasize um, today for the rest of our time is just the exhortations that are based on Christ's return. Christ is coming, and so you're to do what? Because he's coming. And so that's what we're going to look at um, uh, this morning. There's one sentence um, in our booklet that kind of jumped out at me, and our, the rest of our time will be just kind of unpacking part of this, actually. It says, um, see the exhortations and commands to be watchful, prudent, courageous, discerning, zealous, patient, joyful, sober, committed and prayerful in our hope of Christ's return. So we're waiting uh, for uh, Christ's return and we're to do it, we're exhorted to do it in all of those um, ways. And so um, I'm just going to take you through some passages that talk about readiness for Christ's return and what that means. And um, as I've gone through passages of scripture, I've actually just kind of been overwhelmed at how many there are. So I'm just going to choose a few of the passages of scripture because this is a huge part of the Christian life. And it's a huge part of the New Testament. You start looking for passages that talk about the Lord's return and then give you an exhortation based on the Lord's return. And there's just a ton of passages. I'm going to skip. I'm only going to get to um, part of them. So... Um, and I think we understate the importance of this aspect of the Christian life. And maybe we do it because Christians don't all agree about the end times. Um, you know, we, we disagree with one another and um, that's okay. Actually, the, the prophets didn't understand what they wrote and they thought about it. They considered, maybe they debated with each other and they're all surprised. God likes surprises. Um, they're all surprised with how it uh, turned out. None of them had it exactly right. And so that's, that's okay for us to, um, you know, ponder scriptures. Only a Christian is going to take the trouble to ponder scriptures, believe that it's all going to come true and figure out how um, is it going to uh, come true. But um, I think because we're kind of gun shy about, well, I don't want to be cause division or offend somebody, we kind of underplay this aspect of the Christian life. And the New Testament doesn't. The New Testament, uh, uh, it's hard to overstate how important uh, this task is of being ready for the Lord's um, return. The Bible ends on this note, and uh, this isn't, uh, well, it is the best passage we could look at. Um, um, but it ends with um, telling us to be ready for uh, the return of Christ. Revelation chapter um, 22, he said to me, do not seal up the words 
of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. The message of this book is for now. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong. The one who is filthy still be filthy. And let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness. And the one who is holy still keep himself holy. And I think the idea of that is not commanding you to be uh, filthy um, or, or righteous. It's saying the decision is now. The decision is now. So if you're going to decide now to be filthy, then that's it. That's it. That's that, that you're at a fork in the road. Um, and uh, so the decision is now to be um, ready. The time is near. Behold, I'm coming quickly and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he's done. And there's a judgment. Christ is coming and there's a judgment. And there's a judgment for Christians. We'll talk about that uh, a little bit. Um, but I'm coming quickly, the Lord says to us. This is his final word to us. Uh, to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city. And I, I may be getting ahead of myself, but um, maybe the first thing about being ready for Christ's return, the first exhortation is be saved, <laughs> be saved. And that's kind of what he's talking about here, about washing your robes so that you have the right to enter uh, the tree of life. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and immoral persons and the murderers and the idol idolaters and everyone who loves and practices lying. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things. For the churches, I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come. Let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. And that's an invitation to believe. It's also an invitation to take part in the task of discipleship as well as part of the readiness. Because the spirit and the bride say, come. The one who hears is also to invite others to say, come, and it's an it's a offer, it's a free offer. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost, a great way to, to um, describe what uh, the gospel is. So um, then there's a word of warning about adding to this book, maybe, maybe the book of Revelation, maybe the whole Bible, because it's really ending here and pretty sort of self-consciously ending the Bible with this. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I'm coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. So I read you that. It's one of the passages that speaks of readiness for Christ's return. But um, I mostly just read it to say the Bible ends on that note. So this is a really important um, aspect of, um, of the Bible and of, of certainly of the New Testament. Okay, I've gotten a little bit ahead of myself because um, we're going to uh, go through passages. You know, Tim listed like 10 or 11 of exhortations based on Christ's return. And we're going to go through like seven. So be saved. Okay. Because Christ is returning. Be busy. Be busy. Be pure. That's a big emphasis. Be prayerful. Be courageous. And be loving. How many is that? Six, I think. So that's what we're going to, we've done the be saved, I think. Um, the next one is be busy. That's an exhortation in light of Christ's return. And uh, for this, uh, we can go to Acts uh, 1, verse 6, and um, see kind of literally the Lord leaving and then telling him what to do when he comes back, uh, in the meantime, while he comes back. So when they had come together, this is um, during the Lord's resurrection appearances to his disciples, uh, when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? Christ has risen from the dead. It seems like everything is coming to a culmination. Um, is it the, at this time you're, you're fulfilling everything about your promises? He said to them, not, um, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm doing something else. No, he said, it's not for you to know the times or epochs, which the father has fixed by his own authority. Uh, timing of when I'm going to tie it all together is not, shouldn't be your concern right now, but rather this a task that he's giving, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. And after he said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on and a cloud received him out of their sight. And they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, as they were, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them and said to them, men of Galilee, um, sorry, why do you look, stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. And so they weren't to uh, sit there watching for him to uh, go come back in the same way that he had done. But they are actually to give their attention to the task that he told them to do in his absence, which is to be a light 
to be witnesses of him, to make disciples. Um, and to do it first in Jerusalem, and then it was going to spread to Judea and Samaria, and then even to the remotest part of the earth. And when, it, when all the nations hear the gospel, then Christ is going to uh, return, um, just like he came. And so the angels were saying, you know, they're sort of gaping. You can picture them, you know, just sort of gaping up, and the angels come and uh, tell them not to be doing that. Um, but to basically to get busy, although one caveat to that, they're just to wait because they, they weren't clothed with power of the Holy Spirit yet. So actually don't get busy, just wait for the Holy Spirit to come. And that came 10 days later. Um, but after that, they were to be busy about the task. Uh, now they're fully equipped. We're fully equipped with the power of the Holy Spirit. We're clothed with power from on high in order to do this um, task. And a big emphasis of scripture is to be busy about this task. Christ can come at any moment, and that's a big emphasis of Scripture too. At any moment, Christ can return. Uh, Christians won't know the timing. Even, even mature Christians aren't going to know the timing. They'll be surprised at the timing of Christ's return. And a big emphasis of Scripture, it's said over and over again, and it's given in parables, is be found busy about this task. Be found busy uh, about the king's business while the king is um, away. Um, and so there's many parables that speak of that. Um, I can take you to um, this, Matthew 24 and verse 42. Therefore, be on the alert, be watchful, be watchful, okay? Um, or be ready. How, how to be ready will be busy. Be, watch, be on the alert for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would not have been on the alert and would have not allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you also must be ready for the son of man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. Who then is the faithful and sensible slave whom his master put in charge of his household to give them food at their proper time? And the Lord gave this parable over and over again with, with a little bit of different variations. But it's always the idea of a master going away for a while, and it's not clear when he's going to come back. He's going to come back kind of at any moment. And giving his servants something to do, something to do. And when he comes back, he needs to find them busy about the thing that he uh, wanted them to do, the task, that he want, which is being witnesses in Jerusalem, uh, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. Uh, who is the faithful and sensible slave whom his master put in charge of his household to give them food at their pro proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing. It's about doing. This uh, readiness is about a task, so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will put him in charge of all of his um, possessions. Okay, so to be busy, and I don't think the idea is like the exact moment that Christ returns, you're witnessing to somebody. That's great. That, that would be wonderful. I don't think that's exactly what it means. I mean, you could be asleep when Christ returns and that's okay. Um, we, we have to sleep. But I think the idea is that your, your life is going to be about being busy about the king's business. And uh, there's a blessing in that. There's a reward in that. And we're to be looking for that reward, looking in hope uh, for that reward and organizing our life um, in that way. Uh, Truly I say to you, he will put him in charge of his possession. But if that evil slave says in his heart, my master is not coming for a long time and begins to beat his fellow slaves and eat and drink with drunkards, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him at an hour which he does not know, and cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I think maybe the readiness there is, is being saved, for one thing. I mean, the, the, that description sort of sounds like hell uh, for, for those who are not uh, saved. But there's also a judgment for believers. There's a loss of reward um, for believers. The judgment is going to be joyful that for every, every believer. There's going to be something to commend and a reason for joy for every believer, but there's going to be degrees um, of it, and there's going to be a judgment, and it's uh, based on readiness. Since the exhortation for us is um, to be um, ready, um, lots of other scriptures that that just put this in a slightly different way. Luke 12: Be dressed in readiness. Keep your lamps lit. Be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast, so that they may immediately open the door to him when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master will find on the alert when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will gird himself to serve and have them recline at the table and will come up and wait on them. Whether he comes in the second watch or even the third and finds them so blessed are those slaves. 
But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have allowed his house to be broken into. You too be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Um, the, the picture used over and, ago, over and again is the thief in the night who doesn't announce his coming. He just comes when, when you're least expecting him to come. Uh, the Lord uses that over and over again to speak of the timing of his return, even for believers. Um, and in 1 Thessalonians 5, um, Paul makes the distinction to the Thessalonians who are not real strong on their assurance. Yeah, he's going to surprise you like a thief, but he's not going to harm you like a thief in the night. And so he, he uh, makes a distinction um, there. But, but certainly the timing of it is when we least expect it, even for Christ, who we our Lord um, and our Savior uh, to come. So Peter kind of asked a similar question. Lord, are you addressing this parable to us or to everyone as well? Are, are you talking to believers? We're not going to know the timing of your coming. And the Lord said, who then is the faithful and sensible steward whom his master will put in charge of his servant to give them their rations at the proper time? It's believers. It's believers that are given a task. And so the, even this statement about the thief in the night is actually for believers. Blessed is he that, blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that slave says in his heart, my master will be a long time in coming, begins to beat the slaves, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him. And in an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. And that slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his master's will will receive many lashes. But the one who did not know it and will and committed deeds worthy of a flogging will receive but few. From everyone who has been given much, much will be required. And to whom they entrusted more of him, they will ask uh, the more. Okay, so be busy. That's uh, 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 and about the king's business, about the, um, the work of the age, the, the task that we've uh, uh, been given. Okay, be pure. And that's a, that's a huge one in scripture. And I'll, I'll give you just a few quickly. Second uh, Peter 3. Verse nine, um, the, day, the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? That's the, that's the exhortation based on Christ's coming. Looking for and hastening the coming of the Lord because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent, make effort to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless without um, business left undone, especially as it comes to your uh, purity uh, before the Lord. So be pure uh, in light of Christ's uh, coming. Titus uh, 2.11 the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possessions, zealous for good deeds. So grace instructs us to put off worldly desires and to live in a godly way as we look for the blessed hope in appearing. It's a hope. I don't think we're going to be, we're supposed to be cringing um, because Christ is going to uh, return. It's, it's more like um, knowing that you're going to be vindicated, that you're, the work that you're doing uh, for the kingdom matters and is going to be rewarded. When he comes, it's uh, going to be rewarded, um, but uh, it's to cause us to live purely live uh, righteously and godly being zealous for good deeds. First John uh, three, two beloved. Now we are the children of God and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we'll see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is uh, pure. And so we're to be purifying our lives from sin in order to be about the task of discipleship so that our lives, instead of being busy with sin, self, worldly desires, worldly uh, lust is uh, separate from that, purified from that in order that we might be busy about uh, this task. And so I think that's how that uh, fits together. So be saved, be busy, be pure, be prayerful. That's an emphasis. Um, it might tell you that um, 
it, prayer is needed for the task as well that we're to be busy about in order to be ready. Be on guard so that your hearts will not be weighted down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of life. And that day will not come on you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all who dwell on the, fa on, on the face of the earth. But keep alert at all times, praying, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. And so we're to be praying about readiness. Um, 1 Peter 4, 7. Um, the end of all things is near. That's how we're to live, and especially in a time of persecution when it looks like things are ramping up. Um, Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Because the end is at hand at any moment. Uh, could be coming. You're to get serious about prayer about prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sin that also is tested uh, in a time of persecution. Be hospitable to one another without complaint, uh, right? As persecution is ramping up and as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So it's kind of normal Christianity in the face of ramping persecution, which makes you think that the end is near. Um, get serious about prayer. Above all, love one another. That's going to be tested. That's going to be uh, stressed. And uh, continue to reach out to one another in hospitality and start using your gifts or keep on using your gifts. Do it all the more in uh, the church um, as well. So be uh, prayerful. Be courageous in light of Christ's return. I think that's, that's actually um, really what the hope of Christ's return is to do for us, is to cause us to approach the task of discipleship with courage. James 5, 8. You too be patient, strengthen your hearts. That's courage. Strengthen your hearts for the coming of the Lord is near. That's if we're living in light of his return, saying he's going to come at any moment, um, it actually should give us um, courage. 1 Peter 1, 13. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Gird up the loins uh, of your mind. Um, Keep sober in spirit and fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Um, it's an interesting way of describing the coming of Christ, the moment of the coming of uh, Christ. It's going to be grace brought to you. You know, Christ relates to us through his grace. And when he comes again, uh, it's going to be more grace. It's going to be the same grace uh, that he's shown to us uh, all along. There's going to be rewards divvied out and a loss of reward for those who uh, haven't done what they should to be ready for Christ's return. But the reward itself is grace. It's grace upon grace that he would um, uh, work out in us gifts, uh, uh, deeds uh, that he would reward. Uh, so it's going to be all grace. And I, I think that should give us an attitude. Yes, we're headed for a judgment scene with Christ, but it's going to be a joyful uh, judgment uh, scene uh, with him. And so instead of like this kind of cringing fear that would make us um, go about the business of the task that we're given of uh, discipleship, I, I think it's to, to, we're to go about it on a triumphant note. You know, when Christ comes again, he's coming as King of Kings and Lord of Lords and as victor. And we're part of that. And the work that we're doing now is part of that. It's going to be uh, rewarded. So as you go through a difficult time, prepare your mind for action and, and fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you, and that will allow you to uh, go about the work of being ready for Christ's uh, return. So be courageous, and I would even put it this way as part of this being courageous, take risk. Take risk as part of uh, being uh, ready for Christ's return. And of course, I'm referring to the parable of the talents. I'll read you the version in Luke. While they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem. And they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately, which is not quite true. There's going to be a gap of time. There's going to be a task. There's going to be a time when the, the master is uh, absent. So he said, a nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. That's what Christ is about to do. Um, and he called 10 of his slaves and gave them 10 minas and said to them, do business with this until I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned after receiving the kingdom, he ordered that these slaves to whom he had given money be called to him so that he might know what business they had done. The first appeared saying, Master, your mina has made 10 minas more. And he said to him, Well done, good slave, because you have been faithful in a little thing. You will be in authority over 10 cities. 
The second came saying, your mina master has made five minas. And he said to him also, and you are to be over five cities. And another came, the last one, master, here's your mina, which I kept away in a handkerchief very safely. Um, for I was afraid of you because you are an exacting man. You uh, take up what you did not lay down and reap what you did not sow. But he said, by your own words, I will judge you, you worthless slave. Did you know that, that I am an exacting man, taking up what I did not lay down and reaping what I did not sow? Then why did you not put my money in the bank? And having come, I would have collected it with interest. Then he said to the bystanders, take the mina away from him and give it to the one who has the 10 minas. And they said to him, master, he has 10 minas already. I tell you that to everyone who has, more shall be given. But from him who has, from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. But these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. And the last servant was risk averse. Was risk averse. And he says why. It's because of his view of the character of the master made him afraid. Made him afraid to take a risk. Um, and so the Lord says, well, uh, by your own words, I'll judge you then. Um, you, should have, you should have just taken a minimal risk, tiny risk, and put my money in the bank. You didn't take any risk. Uh, you should have just, just taken a tiny risk, put my money in the bank, and it would have come back um, with interest. The other two good and faithful slaves were not risk averse. And in order to make, well, what, what is it, 100% return? Is that what it is? Because they doubled the amount uh, given to them. They had to spend the money in order to make the money. In fact, that's what he told them to do, do business. He, he gave them money and told them to, with that money, do business with it until he returns. And that's the way they phrase it when he uh, speaks to them. Um, your mina master has made five minas. I think I'm mixing the two and getting the amounts wrong here. But um, the money makes money by being spent, you know, uh, by, by uh, taking a risk. And uh, I think it's their view of the master, his goodness towards them, the triumph that they have in him that, that gives them courage to actually take that risk as opposed to the first guy who, or the last guy who uh, won't take um, any risk. I met another Christian guy um, recently, um, and I'm not going to have more interaction with him, but uh, before I left, he goes, stay dangerous. You know, what is, it, what is he talking about uh, by that? Well, he's talking about this. He's talking about uh, taking a risk for, um, for the Lord. Okay, so um, be saved, be busy, be pure, be prayerful, be courageous, uh, be loving. I do have time for this. This is working out well. Okay, um, Hebrews... 1024. Um, this is kind of the application part of Hebrews. It's said a lot about Christ and about our salvation, and then um, he's kind of shifting to application at this point. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. So he's talking about Christ's return, the day. That's the day of Christ's return. You can see it's drawing near. And so what are you to do? What are you to do more of? Uh, because the day is uh, drawing near. Well, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging uh, one another. And all the more, if you've been doing well at this, do it better, you know. Um, as you, as you start seeing the day drawing near, in other words, um, you know, scripture tells us, um, in the last days, evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse. So you start to see that, that happening, start to see the day drawing near. Well, that's a, that's a, a reason to do this, to love one another, to, to, uh, be faithful in assembling, uh, together and encouraging one another. It gives, um, specific, in, uh, instructions about how to encourage one another, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. And I don't really like the way my translation translates this. Um, because it says, let us consider how, like you're considering a process, how to stimulate one another to love and uh, good deeds. What it actually says um, in the original is, let us consider one another for um, stimulating into love and good deeds. Um, 
So the thing that you're considering is one another. Let us consider one another for the purpose of stimulating uh, to love and to good deeds. And they kind of kind of botched it. Well, sort of. They, they still get the same idea. But you're to consider one another for how to provoke one another, how to spur on one another to love and, um, and, and good deeds. Um, do you do this by setting a good example for people of what it means to follow the Lord? It's part of it. It is part of it. It's part of it. Uh, but um, it's, not, it's not really the whole of it. You know, and if you set an example, you just kind of mind your own business. And you, you know, it just kind of happens. People see it, and, and it has an impact. It does have an impact on them, um, for sure. And it's really important. It's really important. But that's not exactly what it's talking about here. It's just um, setting an example. It's talking about considering other people around you, specifically for them, not just, not just uh, doing the, the best you can and, and that's gonna rub off people. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying anything against that because that's really important. Uh, but that's not really what it's uh, speaking of here. It's considering specific uh, people. Um, let me ask another question. Does this happen spontaneously? Christians get together for fellowship regularly and this happens spontaneously? Probably so, probably so it happens spontaneously. But actually what it, what it talks about here is forethought. Forethought, consider one another, specifically how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. In my discipleship group, for a little while, we had a guy named Nolan coming to one of my discipleship groups. He came, I think, to church maybe three or four times, sat by Ron over here, um, came to my discipleship group a little more often. And I, 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 he had a good impact on the group. It changed the dynamic of the group because people are reaching out to him, you know, specifically to him. Um, and then he had things to offer um, as well. But I oh, was sorry to see him go. But, um, you know, what's going to spur Nolan on to love and good deeds is different from what's going to spur Judy Wilcox to love and good deeds. You know, those are different. You have to think specifically for those people. And that's part of this task of um, discipleship. And it's actually something that we're to do. This is why I'm talking about it not just because it's part of the task of discipleship, but it's something that we're to do more of as you see the day approaching, is this very thing, this aspect of um, discipleship, not only setting a good example uh, for others or spontaneously encouraging people when you can, all that is good, but also considering each, each uh, person, the people who are actually there and what would, and it kind of reminds you of the Lord, what we started with, he has the tongue of disciples. He's able to speak a word in season. He's able to speak um, exactly what someone needs uh, to hear uh, for the moment in order to uh, encourage them. You have to know them in order to do that, which the Lord did. He took the trouble to know his um, disciples, and that's what we're to do um, as well, and especially as you see the day approaching. Okay, I could um, open it up, but I'm out of time, and I got another sermon to preach, so um, I could open it up, um, and you probably have a number of verses maybe that have come to mind that also speak of what we're to do in light of the Lord's return, this is really just scratching uh, the surface. But uh, be saved, be busy, be pure, be prayerful, be courageous, and be loving. And do it all in the hope, the hope that we have of Christ's soon return. Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for your word. Uh, we pray that you would help us to be ready for your return and that all of us would be found um, good and faithful servants busy uh, with the work uh, of the master, master, purified from sin, saved, prayerful, being courageous, and being loving uh, towards uh, one another. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.